papers and seen that phenomenon that is currently occurring in, I thought it was New Zealand, but I was told it was China, of the sheep walking around in circles. Who's seen that? Anyone seen that? A bunch of sheep just literally walking around in circles. Take a bit of a break, chew a bit of grass. Have you seen it? That they should be doing it for like 15, 20 days. They're just walking, literally. Perfect. It's a perfect circle, by the way. It's a per- they're just walking. And the, and the scientists and everyone's trying to work out why they're doing that. And again, I see that story and I say, God, why call us sheep? Why compare us to sheep? They are stupid. And then the other side, I'm thinking, I wish the sheep had have done that a week before my last message because I could have used that as an illustration, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. We all like sheep. We're referred to as sheep. Hey, I want to continue to talk a little bit about uh, what we started talking about a couple of weeks ago, and that was we looked at the whole parable of the, the sheep and the lost sheep and the ludicrousy of the shepherd leaving 99 to go and find the one. And then we talked about the possibility of it making sense in the context of what if Jesus is talking about the church? And what if in leaving the 99 to find the one, he can do that because the 99 are looking after each other? What if the 99 are actually being church the way that Jesus envisioned church to be, a body functioning, working together, caring for one another, and so on. So I want to bounce off that thought just a little bit more this week. Just a a quick foundation, Matthew chapter 16. Jesus has this conversation with with his disciples. Who do men say I am? Yeah, some say this, some say that. And then he turns to them personally, says, who do you say I am? And they say, uh, Peter says you're the Christ, doesn't he? The son of the living God. And Jesus makes this statement. He said, blessed are you. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. That's a powerful statement there. Um, you, you know you can't get anyone to see who Jesus is. Did you know that? You can't get anyone to see the spiritual reality of Christ. Jesus himself, in his sinless humanity, couldn't get his own disciples to see that, who walked with him and saw the miracles firsthand. Jesus proclaimed, he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. He said, this has come by a revelation from the Father. We need God, don't we? If we want to make a difference in this world, we need God. We need the Spirit of God. We need to pray. We need to trust God. We need to step out in faith. And we need to abandon the thought that we can make it happen. We can't. We're not going to change this world in our own strength. But God has equipped us and given us His Spirit and just simply calls us to step out like children in childlike faith, trust Him and obey Him. Trust and obey. There's no other way. The song used to go years and years ago. In Matthew 16, Jesus makes His statement. He said, "'Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven.'" And he, and he says, goes on and says, on this revelation of who I am, he makes this statement. He says, I will build my church. Amen? He says, I'll build my church. And, and the church I'm building will have a certain characteristic about it. The gates of hell themselves will not be able to stop it. So here's this church that Jesus says, I'm building. I'm building this church. But the church I'm building will be an unstoppable movement. It will be an unstoppable force. It won't be something that, that can look back and go, well, the devil stopped that one, didn't he? Well, the wickedness of the day stopped that one. Well, the culture stopped that. Jesus said, no, no, no. There's nothing out there, not even the power of the enemy himself, can stop the progress and the advancement of what I'm building, what I'm calling church. Amen? There's something powerful about what he is building. And he uses the term, I'll build. In other words, I'm not going to click my fingers and it's there. It's a, there's a process involved in building the kind of church that Jesus said he was going to build when he was crucified, buried, resurrected. He said, I'm building something, I'm making something. Anyone ever make a cake? Yep. Anyone ever make anything? You know there's a process to making something. There's a step here, step. There's a process. Sometimes it's very messy. Amen. I remember a birthday many years ago. My wife's shaking her head. She, as soon as I say cake, she knows where I'm going. Many years ago, she thought she would bless, was it, was it Johnny? Caleb, it was Caleb's birthday. And she got really creative and thought she would make, um, what was it? it was, a, was it a Tigger from Winnie the Pooh? You know, Tigger? She made a Tigger cake. And I'm, I, like, one minute she's there beautifully baking, making this wonderful Tigger cake. And the next minute, I don't know what happened. It was just a moment in the spirit. Something snapped. And I turn around and she's literally throwing cake all over the kitchen there's bits of cake flying everywhere and so on something happened in the process and you know what is it that can be like church too can't it there are moments where we're making and baking and things are going well and there are moments where we just want to pick everything up and throw it all around the room 
making anything is messy. And I think Jesus understood that. Making the church the way he wants to make it, the body of Christ universal, I think Jesus understood it's going to be messy. There's going to be mess. I wish it was more straightforward and simple and clean and structured and, and anyone with OCD would be happy about the way we did it, but it's just not like that, unfortunately. It's messy. So Jesus says this. He says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And then in Matthew 28, he then tells his disciples, here's how I'm going to build my church. He says, go into all the world and get as many converts and decisions as you possibly can. Anyone realise I've just misquoted Matthew 28? Yeah? Jump on me. Don't let me get away with that. People, Jesus, I could take you anywhere. And then Jesus said, Alan shall be the Lord of thy life. And, you know, I could take you anywhere. Come on. Matthew 28, he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then he says, teach them to obey everything I'm commanding you, including what I'm commanding you right now, which is they then in turn need to turn around and go and make disciples and baptize and teach the people they're discipling that they need to go back to the start of the continuum and they need to also make disciples. And it's this continuum of God using people, using the church. Jesus says, I'm building the church. But then he says, how am I going to build it? I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. That's my method. That's my choice. I'm choosing to use you. Each and every one of you sitting here right now, if you have begun that journey, you've put your faith in Jesus, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, if you know that that's your only ticket to be reunited with the Father and to get to heaven, if you know that's the only way your sin can be dealt with and you've bowed your knee to that, then Jesus is saying, I'm building my church and I'm choosing to use you. Isn't that exciting? I don't care how old you are, how young you are. He's saying, I'm going to use you. You are my method. You are my method by which I'm going to build a church and not just a church as in a building. I'm, this is how I'm going to build a people, a movement that even hell itself will not stop the advancement of. That's an attractive thought. Amen? That's an attractive thought. Who doesn't want to be a part of a movement that is unstoppable? Hey? I want to be a part of a movement that is unstoppable. I don't want to be a part of something that is fickle, that gets embarrassed of itself every time a news headline comes out. I don't want to be a part of something that, that a government can say you're locked down out of your buildings for a year and all of a sudden my movement dies. Jesus never said I'm building a movement that can be stopped by anything, not even hell itself. In other words, when we have a lockdown, the movement doesn't stop. Amen. If, if we get restrictions again, the movement doesn't stop. Because Jesus said, I'm building it in such a way that it will keep progressing and moving forward. This is an unstoppable thing that I'm doing. And it won't stop until I return and say that's enough. Up until that point, the kingdom of God and the church of God will continue to move forward. So he said, I'm building. And then he said, here's how I'm doing. I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. Some people are sitting there maybe getting a bit... Nervous about that fact. What does that mean? Does that mean I've got to get on a street corner and preach? If you want to, go for it. But no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, follow me. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, follow me and wherever I lead you to be a builder, a carpenter, a candlestick maker, a baker, a politician, a rock star, a movie star, a, a whatever, somewhere in that mix, I'm going to lead you into that space I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. Teach you how to bring people to the kingdom. Because at the end of the day, that's the only thing that's going to last. It's the only thing that's going to last. So Jesus is very passionate about his church. He's very passionate about growing it. But what I want to do this morning is I want to jump off something I mentioned a couple of weeks ago at the end of my message. Are you a part of the crowd or are you part of a community? Are we, are we gathering here as a crowd or are we a part of a community? Je Jesus had no problem attracting crowds, didn't he? Everywhere Jesus went, he attracted crowds of people. Lots of people came to Jesus. They were interested in Jesus. They were inquisitive about what he was teaching. They were excited about what he was doing. He was something different to what they were used to. And so people loved to come and gather around Jesus. And Jesus always had crowds. But there were many times, too, where Jesus actually, he wanted to distance himself from the crowds, didn't he? 
He wanted to break away from the crowds. He, he would go up on a mountain in silence to pray and spend time with the Father and the crowds would be running around in a frenzy. Where is he? Where is he? He didn't want to be in the crowds. Now, Jesus loves crowds. I don't think he has a problem with crowds. But what's interesting is Jesus attracted crowds, but he's always intending on building a community. His intention was always to build a community, never, ever, simply to gather a crowd. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a part of a crowd because the entry into community is usually the crowd. Amen? People usually came to the crowd, heard, experienced, saw, and from crowd... The goal was then to go from member of the crowd to begin to enter into the community. But Jesus' end game was never just, let's get a crowd. It was always, I want to build a community. In Luke chapter 6, verse 17 to 19, it says, He went down with them and stood on a level place. This is Jesus. It says, A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, the coastal regions around Tyre and Sidon, who'd come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him. Jesus attracted the crowd, but notice what he says there. He says that, that there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people. So we see this crowd and within the crowd we see the community of Christ's followers. There's a crowd and within the crowd there is community. We, we see the same thing in Luke seven eleven. It says, soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. So we've got the crowd going with Jesus. We've also got the community of disciples. There's nothing wrong with crowds, but there's many mentions in the, uh, these ancient documents where the writer makes a distinction between, hey, this was the crowd, but this was the community of faith. This was the bunch of people, but these were the disciples. These were the ones that made up the numbers, but these were the ones that were involved. These were the ones pressing in. And there's a distinction between a crowd and a community. The question I want us to think about today is, are you a part of the crowd or are you part of the community? And I'm not just talking about a rise, okay? We're going to follow this stream a little bit over coming weeks What I'm talking about is kingdom. Let's think kingdom for a second. Let's think big picture. Let's think Jesus building a movement that's unstoppable. Let's think Jesus saying, I'm using you to do it. Let's think along those lines. Are you part of the crowd or are we part of the community? I want to give you this morning just seven simple things to think about. And you can ask yourself where you fit. Do you fit under the label of crowd or do you fit under the label of community? The first one is this. Crowds consume and community contribute. Crowds consume, they take. But a community contribute. You see, often crowds came to Jesus in order to get something from him. And it looks a lot like in our Western modern church world that we have that same kind of mentality, don't we, in the life of church. It's about, I'm coming to get. What can I have in this space? What can I have from God? What can I have from you? What can you give me? You see, part of this is not the fault of the church. Let me clarify something here. Go back to the 80s, 90s. This perfect storm happened in the church world. We, we had these big church growth conferences for pastors and leaders. And you would go along, and a lot of the teaching was about how do we get bums on seats in our church? How do we get a crowd? How do we get a lot of people to come? Because if we get people to come and get people to stick, well, here, and I understand all that. I, 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 I get it. I understand uh, uh, the gathering of a crowd. I want more people here because I want more people to hear about Jesus Christ. Amen? I want more people to meet you people because you people are good people, and I believe that God could use you to reach that person that walks through the door. So there's nothing wrong with that. But there was a lot of teaching about how to get a crowd, not so much about how to turn the crowd into a community. If you had lots of numbers, you, you, you felt like you were doing something right. And I'm not saying you weren't, but I'm not saying you were either. So in order to get large numbers, here's what happened. If we want to get large numbers, we've got to give the people what the people want. How many of you know that sometimes what you think you want isn't really what you need? Amen? How many of you have children? They think they know what they need, but it's really what they want. But you know what they want is not really what they need. And there's this clash, this rubbing away. And sometimes the kids will dig their heels in. And sometimes mum and dad, we just get over it, don't we? We go, whatever, here you go. 
And sometimes they win the battle. They shouldn't, but they do, because we're human and we're tired. And sometimes they win the battle. But it's not good for them to win the battle. Because it's not what they need. We give them what they want, but it's not what they need. And so churches started going, well, what do people want? Well, we want smoke machines and coloured lights and this kind of this and this, that. And so we started giving people what they wanted in order to attract big crowds. And we got big crowds. But did we turn the crowd into a community? Did a lot of numbers mean we had a lot of disciples? I, I, I question that. And it's interesting because statistics and studies and research now are showing that the answer to that question is probably no. We had youth groups of 200, 300 kids, rock bands up the front, lights, all that stuff, smoke machines, giving them everything they want, hot dogs at the front door. Their attention span's that big, so make sure you only talk for three minutes. And then years later, where are these people? Not interested in Jesus. They're kind of inoculated to it. Been there, got the T-shirt, done it. I'm not saying that the, the, the method and contextualization is wrong. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying now is that, that, that current trends and what they're finding now in research is that giving everybody what they wanted didn't necessarily turn them into a community and it didn't turn them into a strong followers of Jesus. So churches started giving people what they wanted. People started coming along and then expecting to get what they wanted. I mean, what do you think they did when they didn't get what they wanted? They just left. Or they'd go and find another place that would give them what they want. So we'll jump from this one to that one to that one. I want you to preach this way. Well, guess what? Every time somebody does something in a church that you like, there's probably a very good chance somebody else doesn't like it. Isn't that right? Yeah? I'll tell you what I've been told. I preach too long. I preach too short. I preach too simply. I preach too deeply. I can, I've had the gamut to the point where I'm thinking, am I five people? You know, your music's too loud, your music's too soft. And this or that. It's like, hey, please. But I kind of get it because we kind of created this sort of system of entertainment, Christian entertainment to a certain degree. But the problem is it hasn't built the kind of church that Jesus talked about that the gates of hell themselves couldn't stop. And it hasn't engaged the community in mission the way that Jesus said in Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples. It hasn't clicked. The Lego pieces haven't come together. There's a disparity there somewhere. In fact, a sign of spiritual maturity is an inward inclination towards contribution as opposed to consumption. Anyone ever play, anyone play lawn bowls here? Anyone? Oh, don't put your hand up if you do. Seriously, it's lawn bowls, dude. Come on. No, I'm not bagging the lawn bowlers. I've got a family history of lawn bowlers. Not me, but the other side of the family. Good lawn bowlers too, by the way. But when you play lawn bowls, you get this ball, right? And you get on the ground and you bowl this ball. And every lawn bowl has a bias. And that is it's weighted on one side so that a lawn bowl will not go in a dead straight line. It curves a certain way. You bowl that thing and it goes and it curves a certain way. And most of us, by nature, without Christ, have a bias towards consumerism and consumption. We want, we want. When Christ comes into our world, I believe he changes that bias. And part of, one of the marks of spiritual maturity is instead of coming in and going, what can I get out of everybody and everything and God, we start to, instead of consuming, we start to become contributors and we change the question and we start saying, what can I give to others? What can I give to God? What can I give to the community as opposed to what can I get? And it's a mark of spiritual maturity. See, as long as you sit in a crowd, consumption is fine because the crowd just wants what they can get. But community is different. When we enter into community, we become part of community. We go from being consumers to contributors. And we realize that we're here to build something. It's called the kingdom of God. And when I'm building something, I have to contribute when I build Consumers are taking bricks off the wall. Contributors are trying to put bricks on the wall to build this thing called the kingdom. Are you a consumer or are you a contributor? In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul, uh, speaking, he says this, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. Now, this is the only time these words are recorded, by the way. Not recorded anywhere else. Don't go back through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find it. 
But Paul had this moment of revelation, this encounter with Jesus. We all know the road to Damascus. The Lord taught him some things. And here's what the Lord said to him. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let me change it. It's more blessed to contribute than to consume. It's more blessed to be a contributor than it is to be a consumer. And somewhere along the way, we can lose that, can't we? We can lose that sense of having something to contribute and the desire to contribute and become consumed again with what do I get out of this? And when I'm not getting what I want out of this, I'll just move on. Well, them kind of people will never build the kingdom of God. Those type of people are not the type of people Jesus talked about when he said, I'm building a church that even the gates of hell won't stop the progress of. Amen? John chapter 6, verse 26 We've got this crowd of people, they start following Jesus because they see a miracle, right? And that's great. Miracles attracted crowds all the time. And so these people are following Jesus because of the miracles that they saw. But then what happened is, is they continued following him a little bit and their motivation for why they followed him changed. They see this miracle, they follow him, they're out in the wilderness somewhere. He, he sees there's no shops around or they're all closed. and they got, So he, he does a miracle and feeds thousands of people. And then further on down the track, they're all coming to him and he's having a discourse with them. And he says this to them. He says, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the sign. They started off, it says, go back to the beginning of the chapter. They started following, it says, because they saw the signs he performed. They started following him because he he was God and because he did amazing things. But by this stage, he says, you're not following me for those reasons anymore. He says, you're not following me because of the signs I performed. You're just following me because... I fed your belly. You ate the loaves and fishes. That's why you're following me. You're following me because I gave you this material thing, this food. So you're following me because of that. It's all about what you're getting out of me now. Somewhere it changed. Somewhere it changed. And Jesus says, your motivation along the way has changed. It's just what you can get out of me now. That's why you're you're following me. What is is he saying? He's saying, you're now becoming a consumer. Don't allow yourself to become a consumer of the things of God. Be a contributor of the things of God. Be a contributor to the kingdom. Number two, crowd spectate and community participate. Crowd spectate. Crowds love to gather and stand back and watch. Oh, what's going on here? Let's watch. I just watch everybody else do the work. I watch everybody else do the, put the energy in. I watch everybody else. Crowds love to spectate, but community participate. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, we get the first glimpse into the birthing of this movement you and I are a part of. When we read Acts chapter 2, you're reading what started you. You're reading the process that began to get you here, right? It says that they devoted themselves, speaking of this new group of believers, Peter preaches, the church starts, and it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves. That, that, that to me sounds like participants. They're participating in something. They devoted themselves to these things. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were gathered and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And I love the end result of that kind of community. It says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God added to that. God looked down and said, that's my community. That's my Matthew 16 church. That's what I'm talking about right there. And I'm going to chuck people into that. I'm going to bring people into that community. I'm going to bring people into that space. I often wonder today, if if, if I was reading that today, if that was being written today, what would be said about, about the church? And would it finish with God going, I'm so impressed with that. That's exactly what I meant. I'm going to add to that number. Or would God be going... I've got to take him somewhere else. I've got to do something over here because that's just turned, pear-shaped, so to speak. It's not what I envisioned. It's not what I gave my life for anyway. I don't know. Acts chapter 8, verse 4, after the, 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 the uh, martyrdom of Stephen, he says that the believers scattered. This was not the apostles, just the believers scattered everywhere out of Jerusalem. And it says that everywhere that they went, they preached the word wherever they went. That to me sounds like a bunch of people who are not content to spectate and sit back and go, let's see what else Jesus wants to do. They're getting their hands dirty. They're getting sweat on their brow and they're contributing to the kingdom of God. They're contributing 
to the kingdom of God. They're participating in what God is doing in their day, in their age. You could have been born in 15th century China, but you weren't. You were born here and you're here now. And you have one crack at it. One crack. One crack at, at, at going, God, what is it in this season, this time, that I can somehow play my role and link myself and my time, my energy with the will of God? What are you doing, God? How can I be a part of it? How can I be a part of it? it, it, it it's, it's a great thought to dwell on. One shot, it's over. One shot and it's over. This doesn't sound like a bunch of spectators to me when I read the story of the early church and the formation of this group of people. They sound to me like people that said, I want to participate in this. I'm going to do something in this space. Number three, crowds care for themselves and community care for each other. Amen? Crowds just care for themselves, but a community care for each other. They buy into each other. They carry one another's burdens. They pray with one another. When one person hurts, they hurt. When one person rejoices, we rejoice. This imagery that the Bible gives us, these ancient writers give us, of, of when we come to Christ, we become this thing called a body. We become this thing called a body. And crowds just care for themselves. What's in it for me? Community can lay aside what's in it for them for the sake of what can I do for others. We care for each other. We care for each other. Acts chapter 2, verse 45, we just read it. It says that they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. You know what's interesting about that birthing of the church? There's nowhere recorded anywhere that the apostles said to them, now that you're in the kingdom of God, here are the rules. This is the, you, you, have to, you have to devote yourself to prayer. You have to get into the apostles' doctrine. You have to have fellowship and hang out with each other, even if you don't like each other. It doesn't matter. You're one of us now. You have to do that. You have to sell everything. You have to give it. There's no indication whatsoever they were given a rule book. What happened was all we do now is the Holy Spirit came upon them, amen? The Holy Spirit came into them. Peter said this, he said, this promise that you've just seen the Spirit, it's for you and your next generation and so on. Anyone who believes, and it says 5,000 believed, and the assumption is they all received the Holy Spirit at that point of conversion. And the Holy Spirit did something in their hearts. They weren't told to do this. This was a result of a community of people filled with the Spirit. All of a sudden, hey, You've got need over there, man. I've got a means to help you. I'm going to help you. I don't need to go and pray about it. I'm not going to fast a week and see if I or should I help them. I don't know. Sometimes I think we over-spiritualize everything in, in today's day and age. And I don't mean to be unspiritual, but, but there's a lot of things in here that we're already told to do. Love one another. I'm going to pray about whether I should love you. No, just love someone. Forgive people. And this is hard for me. I'll tell you, I find, my, I find this hard. Oh, I don't find anywhere where Jesus says, pray about whether you should forgive. He just says, forgive. And I battle it and I find it hard. But again, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of what I'm called to do. These guys didn't, no indication they went away and prayed, said, my neighbor has a need. I know I could meet it, but I'm just going to pray about whether I should. Sometimes I think we start with the assumption of, of don't. God, you give me a Yes. Truth is, we've got it back to front. We should probably be starting with more assumptions of yes, God, if there's a reason why, say no. Lord, you move upon me to share Christ with that person. He didn't. No, no, well, what if, what if we walked around going, you know what, I, an opportunity's there. What if I shared Christ with them, Lord, if there's a reason why I shouldn't? Then tell me. There's a sick person there. I'd love to pray for you. I already know I'm told to pray. Um, oh, the Spirit hasn't moved upon me to pray for you, so I won't pray for you. Well, you know what? James says, pray for the sick. I might just go and pray for you. If there's a reason why I shouldn't, Lord, maybe you can tell me no. I wonder how different our life would be, our communities could be, our towns could be. If instead of sitting back and over-spiritualizing some of the basic stuff of loving and helping people, we just did it. Amen? We just did it. Just a thought. Just a thought. Crowns care for themselves. Community care for each other. John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus actually said this. He said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. And then he went on and said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I love that. He doesn't say, by this everyone will know you are my disciples if you speak in tongues. Oh, look at him, he must be a follower of Jesus. <laughs> He doesn't say that you'll cast out a demon. Everyone's going to know because you cast out a demon. By this, everyone will know you're my disciple if you heal a sick person and open blind eyes. He doesn't say any of that. He says, you want to know the real sign that's going to tell the world that you are a follower of mine? How you treat each other. 
how you love one another. He said, that will be a sign to the world. There's something about this community that's different to any other community out there. How my people love one another. Because my people actually believe that they are a body. They believe they're connected. They actually believe that. And they live that. As if that, 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 that spiritual metaphor is a physical reality. We live that out. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a community where you know there's genuine love and care for one another? And Jesus said, this will be the number one way they're going to know you're my disciples. You are going to have love in your heart, not only in your heart, hidden away in a little box in the corner. You're going to let it out and people are going to see it. They're going to see you loving one another. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Wow, what a countercultural thought. Value others above yourself. He never, Paul never said to the Philippians, by the way, and this is easy. <laughs> and if you can't do this, you've got problems. No, no, no. This is tough. This is hard. This is hard. But with the grace of God and the Spirit of God, we can do this stuff. Because we're called to be community, not crowd. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you look to the interests of other people. What a different way to live. What a different way to live. Crowds care for themselves, community care for each other. Number four, crowds share a location, community share a purpose. Crowds share a location, they're all together in the one place, but community share a purpose. In fact, the word church, ecclesia, in the, in the Greek, uh, it literally means a gathering of people called out of their homes into a public place or an assembly convened for the purpose of deliberating. That word ecclesia was never used in religious terms. It's not a religious word whatsoever. The word that we have translated church, it's a word that was used to uh, talk about, say, a local council that might meet in a community in the public square for civic deliberation over things to do with the community. That's what it was. The, the church stole the word from the, from the world and said, oh, that kind of explains, let's use that word to explain what's going on here with the Christians. The word fellowship, the word fellowship actually means association, communion, or joint participation or intercourse. That's what it means. Fellowship is not just being in a room together. In other words, when you put those two words together, you look at what church and fellowship is, this community that God is, is building together, we see the picture of Christian fellowship. It's not about being together in a place. It's being together for a purpose. It's about purpose. And if, we don't if you don't share the purpose, then you're not really in the community. And Jesus gave us the purpose, didn't he? Go and make disciples. Bring the kingdom down here to earth. Participate in what I'm doing in your place your time the, the, with, the, with the days you've got be a part of something bigger than yourself and, and, and leave a fingerprint for God down here let me use you as a vessel to make a difference fellowship is not about sometimes we think we had fellowship because we came to a room we just gathered together that's the truth you can just gather together and, and, and groups do it all around the world this morning there are people doing it in pubs right now they're just gathering together they're all in a room hundreds of them you know there, there are people sitting in stands this afternoon. They're going to be watching a sporting event. They're not fellowshipping, but I mean, look, they're all together in one place. But that's not what fellowship is. Fellowship is about the purpose. Not so much the size of the gathering. It's gathering together for a purpose. And we gather together for a purpose, don't we? We gather together to glorify Jesus. We gather together to, to, to lift up the name of Jesus. We gather together, hopefully, to be encouraged to grow in our faith, take our spiritual walk seriously, and to walk out of here and shine a brighter light for the kingdom of God. Amen? Crowds share locations. Community share a purpose. Number five, real quick. Crowds desire comfort. Community desire challenge. That's a big one. Crowds desire comfort. And as soon as it gets uncomfortable, what do they do? They walk away. You who without sin cast the first stone. It's getting a bit uncomfortable here. I'm going to walk away and leave the crowd. <laughs> you got me, Jesus. Rah, rah, rah. Oh, they're coming to get Jesus. Quick, let's run. Woo, take off. It's, not a, it, 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 it's too challenging now. And crowds love comfort, but community desire challenge. Because community know that it's in the challenge that we grow. It's in challenge that we get stronger. Jesus didn't have a problem challenging people. Now, you go and read uh, John chapter 6. Great, great passage there. We've looked at it a little bit there. He gets his big crowd. They start following him and so on. And then Jesus says this really absurd thing to a group of people. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Remember that? Weird. Eating flesh and drinking blood. And of course, he's talking about participating 
in my death, burial, resurrection. He's saying, unless you participate in the life and, and my death and my resurrection power, you can't be my disciple. And it says at that point, it says in verse 66 to 68, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can do this? All of a sudden, up to that point, it was fine. But now the challenge kicks in and they went, ah, oh, no. We'll go back and do something else. And Jesus, being the, 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 the uh, 21st century Western pastor, said, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. Come back. I meant... Um... No, he didn't. It says he turned to the 12 and he said, do you want to go to? There's the door right there. Feel free. Because I'm not interested in building a crowd. I actually want a community because I'm serious about this mission called the Great Commission. Jesus never, he didn't care. If you guys don't like it, feel free to go. Because I only want you here if you're a part of the community. If you're just a part of the crowd, Jesus said, that's fine. At some point, the crowd's going to drop off, but the community are going to be the Matthew 16 group that the gates of hell can't stop. They'll just keep going and going and going and getting stronger and stronger and making ground and making ground and making a difference. In, in the Greek, that word uh, where it says that they walked with him no more, what it literally means is they progressed no more. They might have still been a bunch of people that still believed that he, who he was, but it says they progressed no more spiritually. They were not growing. They weren't interested. We only want to go to here, Jesus. We don't want to go any further than that. We don't want to be challenged too much past about here. That's our point, Jesus. If you start pushing us too far, Jesus, well, we'll just, maybe we'll go over here. I don't know about you. I want to be challenged spiritually. I want to grow. I mean, if the Jesus story is real, and I believe it is, then surely my spiritual growth must matter to me. Surely I've got to be serious about it, you know? If all the stuff in these ancient documents are real, then at some point I'm going to come across stuff that, hey, I, by the way, let me be the first one to say, I don't like a lot of stuff Jesus taught. I don't like it. Some stuff I literally hate. And a lot of it I disagree with. But he's still right. <laughs> Amen? He's still right. I can't get around that mountain. I hate that you say this, Jesus. I actually don't even agree with that. But you're God, so you're slightly more smarter than I am. At the end of the day, if I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God, I know who's going to win. So I've just got to make a choice to accept, here's what Jesus says, here's how he wants me to live my life. But what I found is this, when you get in the groove and in sync with God, here's the thing with God. God, God never takes anything away from us that he doesn't give back something better. I'm a firm believer of that. I'm a firm believer. Whatever the disciples had, when Jesus said, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Remember when he said that? Same thing, Matthew 16. After Peter's great revelation of who Jesus was, Peter then puts his foot in his mouth and says, no, this is not happening to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. From the penthouse to the outhouse in about three verses. Right? But here's the thing. They went on and they did deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. And whatever they got must have been so good that to their very last breath, they couldn't deny it. They couldn't deny it. To their very last breath, whatever exchange took place, they came out winners to the point where they looked back and went, we can't go back to that. This is so much better. Even though it's costing me, this is so much better. God never rips us off, ever. Real quickly, finish up. Number six, crowds seek anonymity. Communities seek accountability. Crowds want to remain anonymous. I just want to be a face. You know? People want to sit in a crowd and you know, people in crowds love to walk around little groups and, you know, oh, did, they, did you hear about this? Start a fire, then run away. And no one knows who started it. Oh, did you see this? Start a fire, run away. No one knows who started it. They love anonymity, people in crowds. It's amazing, a lot of the riots and things that took place in, 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 in the Bible, we don't have everybody's name. But people in crowds don't mind remaining anonymous because when stuff happens, nothing, nothing comes back to them. Community is very different. Community are transparent and accountable. We love accountability in community. Proverbs uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 15, it says, The way of a fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. In other words, here's what I'm thinking. 
give me some input, have some accountability, listen to other people. Romans 14 verse 12 says this, it says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. You ever thought about that? Each of us, everyone sitting in this room right now, here's a fact. You are going to give an account of your life before God one day. That's a, that's a fact. Right? So here's the thing. Why not practice accountability on a daily basis now and prepare ourselves for the ultimate accountability one day when we leave? Why not get used to accountability now? Why not get transparent and real with people and talk about your life and what's going on and so on? Because one day, you're not going to be able to avoid accountability. It'll be forced upon you. Wouldn't it be so much easier if we chose it now? James chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. But watch this last bit. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Hang on a second. Don't we just confess sins to God and how are we getting healed by telling you what's going on? You know what the verse is talking about? It's talking about accountability. It's talking about accountability. I can confess till the cows come home to God. Here's what I believe about God. I'm forgiven. By the grace of God, I'm forgiven. I don't need to crawl back to him every time I make a mistake and beg and say, Jesus, would you hop back on the cross again and buy me another piece of forgiveness? I'm forgiven. Past, present, future, I've been forgiven by Christ for my sins. But at the same time, I don't want to keep going back to Christ every second day for the same thing. But it's easy to do if nobody else knows about it because I know I'll get forgiveness from God. I believe that. But God's not a face, not a body. And he's not a person that's going to ring me in two days' time and go, just wondering how you're traveling with that. How you going with that? What's the end result James talks about here? The end game here is not the forgiveness, it's the healing. Confess to one another and pray for one another so you'll be healed. Healing change, progress comes about through accountability. If I go to Owen, Owen, I'm struggling with this. You know, every Friday night, Owen, I open up a, a beer and then it turns into 40. Every Friday, I can't stop. Every Friday it happens, Owen. And I keep going back to God and I keep praying, saying, Lord, forgive me, I don't want to live like that. But then I do it again and again and again. Owen, would you keep me accountable? I'm telling you, Owen, this is what goes on in my world. Owen, would you ask me? Every couple of days, once a week, whatever, would you, would you ask me? And I'm committed to brutal honesty with you. All of a sudden, there's a mechanism there now. There's a mechanism there that can help bring about healing. There's a mechanism there that helps me with my self-control. There's a mechanism there because I know someone's going to ask me about it because I know there's going to be accountability. I've just brought a mechanism into my life to help me be healed. Amen? Accountability. True community are a bunch of people who hold themselves accountable. There are other places there where, 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 where Jesus talks about, Paul writes, you see a brother sinning. You see a brother sinning, go up to him and go, hey, dude, don't do that, man. <laughs> I can see what you're doing. You don't treat your wife like that, dude. Come on. You know? You, you don't, 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 don't live like this. Don't make that. I can see it, and I know it's not right. I'm just I'm concerned for you. Accountability. But we live in a very insular, jammed up world, don't we? We don't like to talk about that stuff. We don't want to open ourselves up. I'm, I've gone on a little bit, like real last. Crowds value independence, community value interdependence. Isolation is not the environment that we most naturally thrive in. You can survive in a crowd, but you'll thrive in a community. Amen? You'll survive in a crowd. You'll, you'll breathe. You'll wake up. You'll go to bed. You'll go through life. You'll make money. You'll do all that in a crowd. But if you want to thrive in God, and if you want to thrive spiritually, then you do that in a community. You do that in a community. So I want to leave you with those thoughts today. And I want you just to, to sort of think about it yourself. Crowds consume, community contribute. Crowds spectate, community participate. Crowds care for themselves, community care for each other. Crowds share a location, community share a purpose. Crowds desire comfort, community desire challenge. Crowds seek anonymity, community seek accountability. And crowds value independence, 
Community, value, interdependence. I wonder what side of the ledger would you say that you're on? And this is not to say that one side is bad and one side is, is good. But what I am going to say is one side is better and one side is what God wants. And as long as our progress is from community to, uh, sorry, from crowd to community, then I think that's what God wants, amen? If you're in the crowd and you're comfortable in the crowd, can I encourage you, get before the Lord. Get with God or go and talk to somebody about that because we were not created to live in the crowd. We were created to become a part of community. Amen? And I want a rise to be a community. And I want the kingdom of God in Lismore to be a community. And the Church of Australia to realize we are a community. And the Church Universal, we are a community. Because Jesus promised that that is the thing. That is the expression of church that the gates of hell will not stop. Amen? Lord, thank you for your word this morning. God, I know it was a little bit long, God, maybe a little bit, uh, a lot of vegetables there today, God, a lot of cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, and if anyone here is like me, I hate both of them. But Lord, we need that stuff, God, and uh, so Father, we just, we need a balanced diet, and today that's what it was, Lord. I just pray, Holy Spirit, speak to each of us in our hearts, Lord. God, you, you, God, you want you want biblical community. I know that you do, God. I know that's what you died for. Jesus, you said that the church would have this characteristic of being unstoppable. You said that, the, the, that what you're building would have this characteristic of progress and growth, God, individually and corporately, that we would be going forward and moving forward, Lord. And I just pray if there's anything uh, in our hearts this morning, Lord, any of those areas, Lord, where you want to challenge us, I pray, Holy Spirit, when we walk out of here, don't let us forget it. Don't let us just move on to lunch uh, and have whatever it is that we're doing there, Lord. But I pray that we would allow you space and time to speak to us, to challenge us, and to cause us to grow so that we can be all that you've called us to be and we can do all that you have called us to do. And Father, in the next seven days as we get about our community at school and work and so on, Lord, there are people out there, they need to know about Jesus. And God, would you use us, action or word, deed, whatever it would be, would you use us to express the reality of a God that loves them to them this week throughout our community in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.